Have you ever wondered why you need to breathe oxygen? And I know you probably just thought to yourself, yeah, we need it to live. Yeah, but why? Well, it turns out that oxygen is incredibly important for the way your body produces energy, which is a process called cellular respiration. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today we're talking about cellular respiration. Cellular respiration is the way that organisms like you and I produce our energy. It's a process that involves several different enzymatic reactions that all work together to, it, to produce the end product of adenosine triphosphate or ATP. It's an incredibly complex process with lots of different enzymatic steps and lots of intermediates. Now, rest assured, we are not gonna go through this in super fine detail. The overall goal of this particular video is to give you an overview of the different enzymatic processes that are involved in cellular respiration and how those connect in order to produce energy. But before we start talking about those enzymatic processes, I need to talk to you about a specific type of chemical reaction. And that particular chemical reaction is what's known as an oxidation reduction reaction which is also known as a redox reaction. Redox reactions are a particular type of enzymatic reaction that involves the exchanging of electrons between compounds. So how do redox reactions work? Well, redox reactions work because of enzymes called oxidoreductases. And what oxidoreductases do is they are going to remove electrons from a specific compound or atom and then give them to another, another compound or atom. But where do the names oxidation and reduction come from? Well, oxidation and reduction and redox reactions as a whole require pairs. They require an electron donor and an electron acceptor. And in terms of biochemical terminology, the substance that is losing its electrons is being oxidized. That's the oxidation step. Oxidation is the removing of electrons from an atom or a compound. On the other hand, the substance that gains those electrons, an atom or a compound that is gaining those electrons, is being reduced. So there's a couple nice little mnemonics you can use to remember that. The first one is oil rig. Oxidation is losing. Reduction is gaining. So what are you losing or gaining? Well, if you're using an analogy for a redox reduction, well, then you are losing or gaining electrons. Oxidation is losing electrons. Oil reduction is gaining electrons. Rig, oil rig. Another way to remember it is Leo says Ger. Losing electrons, oxidation. Gaining electrons, reduction. Doesn't matter to me which one of those mnemonics you want to pick, but I recommend you pick one and stick with it. But where do the names oxidation and reduction actually come from? Well, reduction comes from the fact that what you're going to be gaining if you're being reduced as a substance is electrons, and electrons have a negative charge. So what happens to your overall charge as a substance? It goes down, it gets reduced, it gets more negative. So hence the term reduction. What are you reducing? The charge on that particular electron acceptor. Oxidation gets its name from the fact that on planet Earth, one of the most common things stealing electrons from something is oxygen. So the thing it steals electrons from is being oxidized. Is oxygen the only oxidizing agent on the planet? Absolutely not, but it is a very common one. For example, if you look at rust on a bumper, that is the oxidation of iron by the oxygen in the atmosphere that iron is losing electrons, it's being oxidized. So how does this play a role in biological systems and why am I talking about this exchanging of electrons in terms of me metabolism? Well, it's simple. When electrons are taken from a less electronegative atom and given to a more electronegative atom, that is actually going to be exergonic. That is going to be a reaction that releases energy. So for example, if you take electrons from a moderately electronegative atom like carbon or hydrogen and give them to a very electronegative atom like oxygen, a lot of energy gets released. In fact, that's what we typically call combustion. So if you take a hydrocarbon like methane or, or propane and you ignite it, what's actually happening is the electrons are being ripped away from the carbon and the, and, and the hydrogen atoms and given to the oxygen atoms in the atmosphere. Now, if you're a living system, 
that's not great, right? You don't want to spontaneously burst into flames. So what living systems do is they remove electrons and they sort of gradually take the energy away from those, uh, of those electrons by giving them to other substances. So rather than going right from carbon or hydrogen to oxygen, they go to a series of different molecules and each one of those exchanges releases a little bit of energy at a time. So how is that going to happen in a biological system? Well, what we're going to use in a biological system are what we call electron carriers. And the two most common electron carriers that we're going to encounter in today's conversation with the relevance to cellular respiration are going to be nicotine adenine dinucleotide and flavin adenine dinucleotide, NAD+, and FAD. So what do these guys do? Well, they can participate in redox reactions. So what you're observing right now is NAD+, and FAD. This is their oxidized form but they can be reduced by taking on pairs of electrons. So what happens with NAD+, it takes on two electrons and a proton when it reacts, so it ends up being NADH. FAD, on the other hand, takes on two electrons and two protons when it gets reduced, and that becomes FADH2. Now, they're electron carriers. Where are they carrying them? Well, what you'll see, and for reasons that will become more obvious towards the end of this video, they're gonna take them to the electron transport chain where they are going to be oxidized. In other words, those electrons are going to be stolen from them by the electron transport chain complexes, turning them back into their oxid oxidized state, NAD plus and FAD. And at that point, they will go back into the cell and participate in more redox reactions being reduced and so on and so forth. So they just oscillate between this oxidized and reduced state and carry electrons from the chemical reactions uh, of things like glycolysis and, and the citric acid cycle and taking them into the electron transport chain and then going back. So why do we do this in the first place? Well, it turns out that most of the molecules that we take in, most of those biomolecules, things like glucose and fatty acids and proteins are packed full of a lot of chemical energy. They contain a lot of chemical bonds as we've talked about in a previous video Chemical bonds represent a form of potential energy called chemical energy. And what we can do is we can harvest those electrons from those molecules and use those electrons as a form of energy to produce ATP. And remember, that's the end game. ATP is the, the energy currency of life. And what we're talking about with cellular respiration is we're talking about a way where, uh, where hetero, chemoheterotrophs can break down their food. They literally oxidize their food rip away those electrons and use those electrons to synthesize the endergonic biosynthesis of ATP. So in order to understand cellular respiration, we have to understand the, the interrelatedness between four different enzymatic pathways that all work together to oxidize our food. And those four enzymatic pathways are called glycolysis, pyruvate oxidation, the citric acid cycle, which goes by like three other names we'll talk about in just a minute, and the electron transport chain coupled to ATP synthase. What we'll do in a few minutes is we'll go through each of these different processes, talk about how they work, how they contribute to the cellular respiration pathway, and their unique products. So again, what we're going to see in this process of cellular respiration is we are going to see a series of catabolic reactions, which are largely exergonic reactions, which are going to release energy. And the goal of this is to release enough energy to produce and perform the endergonic reaction of phosphorylation. We want to be able to phosphorylate ADP and turn it into ATP, which can then be coupled with other endergonic processes within the cell and, and, and be used to power those endergonic reactions. So phosphorylation can be done in two ways in cells. The first way is what we call substrate level phosphorylation. So substrate level phosphorylation is simply the taking of a phosphate group off of one molecule and enzymatically placing it on another molecule. Substrate level phosphorylation is going to occur both in glycolysis as well as the citric acid cycle. And then the other type of phosphorylation occurs through a process called oxidative phosphorylation. And oxidative phosphorylation is going to involve electron transport and, and chemiosmosis. So chemiosmosis is going to be the dissipation of an electrochemical gradient to power the phosphorylation of ADP with an inorganic phosphate. And this is going to happen uh, downstream of electron transport. So we'll talk about uh, all of these processes, but remember the two types of phosphorylation, substrate level phosphorylation and oxidative phosphorylation. So 
We'll start our conversation about cellular respiration with glycolysis. So glycolysis literally means sugar breaking. So glycolysis is the first step in cellular respiration. Now, the thing I want to point out is this. Everything that we take in is going to enter through this into the cellular respiration process at some point, but only carbohydrates really go through the entire process. So when we talk about cellular respiration, we almost exclusively talk about it from the perspective of glucose. And there are lots of reasons for this. First off, glucose is one of the most abundant energy sources on the planet. Almost anything can eat glucose uh, and break it down um, because glycolysis is one of the most ancient and conserved ways of producing energy. The other big thing is that glucose goes through every enzymatic step in the process. Something like fatty acids, for example, they can be broken down and they can enter into the cellular respiration process. They have to be in order to yield energy for you to produce ATP, but they don't start at the beginning. And we'll see later on, they get injected kind of in the middle of the process. Glucose goes through the entire process, okay? So we're gonna start with a molecule of glucose. We'll talk about the products with respect to a single molecule of glucose entering into the process. So we're going to do a little bit of bookkeeping, and that's kind of the tricky part when it comes to metabolism is keeping track of exactly what goes on. One of the things that we're going to want to keep track of is the carbons. So glucose, remember, is a C6 molecule. It's a six carbon molecule. We're going to keep track of where those carbons go. So let's talk about glycolysis. Glycolysis is a 10 step enzymatic process that begins with a single molecule of glucose. And that enzymatic process is broken down into two phases, an energy investment phase and an energy production phase. So let's talk about how this process works. Well, if we're starting with a single glucose molecule, remember that glucose has six carbons, it's going to, it's going to enter into the first step of the process. And the first thing that's gonna happen is through the consumption of a single ATP, that glucose molecule is gonna have a phosphate group added to it. So we're gonna consume an ATP, we're gonna add a phosphate, uh, to glucose to yield something called glucose 6-phosphate. Glucose 6-phosphate then gets isomerized to produce fructose 6-phosphate. Remember, fructose and glucose are just isomers, just same chemical formula, different chemical structure. We then add another phosphate at the expense of another ATP to produce fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. From there, the, uh, the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is going to be broken in half, so we're going to cut it in half, and we're going to end up eventually yielding two molecules of a three carbon compound called glyceraldehyde three phosphate. So what we've done is we've taken a single six carbon molecule. We have added two phosphates. We've consumed two ATPs to accomplish that task and then broken that single six carbon molecule into two three carbon molecules called glyceraldehyde three phosphate. So let's look at where we are. We're halfway through the process. We're halfway through glycolysis at this point and lo and behold, in a process that we're, that, is, that we're hoping to produce energy, we are now negative two ATP. That's right, we're two ATP in the hole. So you may have heard the old saying, you need to spend money to make money. Cells believe in this too. Sometimes you have to spend energy to make energy. The other thing we have to recognize is this, keep track of your carbons. Do we still have six carbons? Yes, we do. Are they contained in the single six carbon molecule anymore? No, they are not because that single six carbon glucose is now two molecules of glyceraldehyde three phosphate. So how does the energy production phase work? Well, remember we start with two molecules of glyceraldehyde three phosphate. So what happens to each of them? Well, each molecule of glyceraldehyde three phosphate is going to have a phosphate added to it. And I know you're thinking, oh great, we're spending more ATP. No, we're not. Because this time we're gonna attach an inorganic phosphate. We're not gonna rip it off of an ATP molecule. Instead, we are going to power this particular enzymatic reaction by releasing electrons. Remember those redox reactions we talked about, right? If we can take an electron from one molecule and give it to another, that's gonna release a little bit of energy. And that's what happens here. A phosphate is added to each of the, the glyceraldehyde three phosphates to produce something called 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. And so now you have two molecules of that. The other thing is those electrons have to go somewhere, right? We can't just release them into the cell and be like, good luck with that. No, they have to go to something and where are they gonna go? They're gonna go to one of our electron carriers. In this particular case, each of those G3Ps is going to give up two electrons and give it to uh, an NAD+. So the end result then of this step is to not only phosphorylate both of those glyceraldehyde three phosphates, we are also going to produce two molecules of NADH. Now what I want you to remember that NADH, the way you should be thinking about it, that's just simply electrons. 
Where are those electrons going to go? Well, NADH will eventually carry these guys to the electron transport chain and then return to participate in more redox reactions. Now, what happens to finish off the energy production phase of, the, of glycolysis? Well, each of these 1,3-bisphosphoglycerates is going to go through another series of enzymatic reactions. Each of these 1,3-bisphosphoglycerates in the end will yield two molecules of ATP through a process called substrate-level phosphorylation. In other words, those phosphates, they each have two now, will be given to uh, ADP to yield ATP. Now, the thing to realize is this. Because each of those 1,3-bisphosphoglycerates ends up producing two ATP, that is a net production of four ATP from the energy production phase. But we have to do a little bit of bookkeeping. Remember that to get to this point, we had to invest two ATP up front, right? The energy investment phase. So if we produce four in the energy investment phase, we have to subtract the two we used to kickstart the whole process. In the end, are we ahead? Yes. So we've produced two NADH in that initial step of the energy production phase. We've also produced a net of two ATP as a result of what we did in the energy production phase. But the other thing we have to realize is we still have all those carbons around. At any point, did we release any carbons in this reaction? And the answer is no. And the way to know that is this. Carbon dioxide only leaves your body in one form. It leaves in the form of carbon dioxide. So if we haven't produced any molecules of carbon dioxide, we have not released any of our carbons yet. That will come later. The remaining two, three carbon molecules are left are known as pyruvate. And pyruvate still has lots of chemical bonds and lots of electrons and can undergo further oxidation to produce yet more energy. So where do we go next? Well, everything that I've just discussed in terms of glycolysis is going to occur in the cytoplasm. And it's going to occur in the cytoplasm, whether it's a prokaryotic cell like a bacterium or a eukaryotic cell like one from our bodies. But this is where things diverge. If you are a eukaryote, everything else I'm about to describe to you is going to take place in your mitochondria. If you are a prokaryote, which you're not, but if you were, it would take place still in your cytoplasm. Why? Because you don't have mitochondria because you're a prokaryote and you don't have membrane-bound organelles. So just remember that. The next step in the process is this pyruvate is going to be loaded into the mitochondria and it's going to undergo a process called pyruvate oxidation. So again, as oxidation should be telling you, if we're oxidizing it, we're going to be taking away some of its electrons. So pyruvate oxidation occurs through a multi-enzyme complex called uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase. And what ends up happening is that uh, for each molecule of pyruvate, remember pyruvate is a three carbon molecule that goes in, uh, we are going to remove one of their carbons. So we're gonna convert that three carbon pyruvate into a two carbon molecule. Where does that carbon go? Well, it gets released as carbon dioxide. We are also in the process going to take away two more two electrons from each of these molecules of pyruvate, which is going to be given to NAD plus to yield another molecule of NADH per pyruvate. And, and then we're going to have, we're going to attach a molecule called coenzyme A to the end of each of those two carbon molecules. The end result, remember per glucose, two pyruvates went in which means we're going to produce two carbon dioxides, two NADHs for each, of the, uh, for each glucose molecule because we brought in two pyruvates. And the end result is the production of two two carbon molecules called acetyl-CoA. And acetyl-CoA is actually the molecule that's gonna move on to the next enzymatic process. So the end result of pyruvate oxidation per molecule of glucose is two carbon dioxides and two molecules of acetyl-CoA and two molecules of NADH. And again, what do we remember about NADH? NADH are simply electrons. Those are gonna to go to the electron transport chain, which we'll get to in a minute. What about CO2? That gets exhaled. That's a waste product of cellular respiration. But because we've only produced two CO2, we've only given up two of glucose's original six carbons, we still have four left. And that's contained within those two molecules of acetyl-CoA. Now, the next step in the process goes by many different names, and this is going to occur again in the matrix of the mitochondria. This is what is known in some cases as the citric acid cycle. It's also known as the tricarboxylic acid cycle, also known as the TCA cycle, and also known as the Krebs cycle. These are all different names for the exact same process. So if I say Krebs or citric acid or TCA or tricarboxylic acid cycle, I am talking about the exact same set of chemical reactions. Now, 
The citric acid cycle uh, uh, is the final step in, in oxidizing our in oxidizing our glucose molecule, our, our formerly glucose molecule, which is actually uh, in the context of acetyl-CoA at this point. It's now in the form of acetyl-CoA. So what's going to happen is it's going to go through a series of enzymatic steps. There are actually eight this time, and it regenerates um, the initial four carbon molecule that's needed to kickstart the process called uh, oxaloacetate. Again, I'm not going to get bogged down in the details of this, but what you need to know is this. As the acetyl-CoAs, remember two were going in from the original glucose, as they go through, each one of those is going to have their carbon stripped away. So each molecule of acetyl-CoA is going to produce two carbon dioxides for a net total of four. They're also going to have the remainder of their electrons stripped away. So three pairs of electrons per acetyl-CoA are going to be donated to three molecules of NADH or NAD plus to yield NADH, which means there's going to be six NADH produced per glucose that enters in. There's also going to be a molecule of FADH2 produced per acetyl-CoA, which means a net total of two FADH2s are produced per molecule of glucose that entered into the process. And through substrate level phosphorylation, we're also going to produce one molecule of ATP or GTP, depending on the cell type, per acetyl-CoA, which is a net gain of two ATP or two GTP per molecule of glucose that entered into the process. The end result is all of the carbon that has entered into this process at the beginning of glycolysis has now been stripped away. How do you know this? Well, we lost the remaining four carbons by producing four carbon dioxides, which will just be off gas. We've also produced a lot of NADH and a lot of FADH and two molecules of FADH2. We produced six more NADH electrons, two FADH2, still more electrons, and all of those are going to go to the electron transport chain. And what we're left with is, is the remaining ATP or GTP, depending on the cell type. And that is, again, what we were trying to accomplish. We've produced energy. We've produced energy currency. Again, through substrate level phosphorylation. But one of the things I want you to notice is this. In all of this process, assuming that everything got converted into ATP and not GTP in this particular cell, through all of that oxidation and all of these enzymatic steps, we have only produced a grand total of four ATP from that molecule of glucose went in. That is relatively inefficient. And that's the thing about substrate level phosphorylation. It's not particularly efficient. It's not a great way of producing ATP. Does it work? Sure. Can it keep small, simple cells al alive? Absolutely. Can it keep you and I alive? And the answer actually is no. In order to produce enough ATP to survive, we have to do something called oxidative phosphorylation, which is significantly more energy efficient. But how does this work? Well, the answer to this are all of those electrons that we've stripped away by oxidizing the original glucose molecule or whatever food molecule it was that entered into the process. So how does this work? Well, we're going to have to talk a little bit about transport and a little bit about redox reactions. Remember all of that NADH and all those and that the FADH2 that we produced during these processes? Well, those are electron carriers, and they have been carrying those electrons to something called the electron transport chain. Now, the electron transport chain is a series of multi-protein complexes that reside in either the inner mitochondrial membrane of eukaryotes or the plasma membrane of respiring prokaryotes. And there are four major electron transport chain complexes. They have very long fancy names, but to make everybody's life easier, we call them complex one, complex two, complex three, and you guessed it, complex four. What's going to happen is the electrons are going to be brought to these electron transport chain complexes. They will then be shuffled through a series of intermediates. And in the process, that will the energy that's released by exchanging these electrons will be used to produce an electrochemical gradient. So here's how this works. The two complexes that receive electrons are complexes one and two. If the electron donor is NADH, NADH interacts specifically with complex one. And what happens is NADH arrives at complex one, it gets oxidized, i.e. gives up its electrons to reduce uh, complex one. The energy that's released in exchanging these electrons is enough energy to actually pump some protons, which are abbreviated H+, across the membrane on the other side to build a gradient. 
Remember, that will be an endergonic process, right? If you're building a gradient, that is going to be active transport. Where does the energy come from? Well, in this case, it's coming from a redox reaction, basically, the oxidation of NADH to NAD+. If you are FADH2, your electrons will be donated to complex 2. Okay. Now, here's the thing about complex 2. Complex 2 is a peripheral membrane protein. It doesn't actually go across the membrane. What that means is complex 2 cannot pump protons. It cannot do any sort of active transport. It still accepts those electrons. Now, regardless of whether or not those electrons were entered in through complex 1 or complex 2, those electrons next step is to be given to a molecule called ubiquinone, which is abbreviated Q. That reduction of ubiquinone to ubiquinol is, is an oxidation reduction reaction. So reduced, that reduced molecule of Q or ubiquinol will then deliver those electrons via, the, the, via that particular biological membrane to complex three. At complex three, ubiquinol will be oxidized back into ubiquinone and complex three will have been reduced. Those electrons from complex three once they exchange that, that little bit of energy that's released is enough to pump more protons across that particular biological membrane. So you can see we're continuing to build that proton gradient, more protons cross the membrane there. And then those, those electrons are then given to another molecule, another carrier called cytochrome C. Cytochrome C then delivers those electrons to complex four where it is oxidized, complex four is reduced, and that exchange of electrons is enough to pump yet more protons across that biological membrane, whether it's the inner mitochondrial membrane or the cell membrane. Now, the thing is this, every time those electrons have been given to another electron acceptor or electron carrier, whether it's cytochrome C or one of the electron transport chain complexes or NAD plus or FAD, every time that happens, a little bit of energy is released, a little bit of energy is released, a little bit of energy is released. And eventually, there isn't enough energy left in those electrons or there's no, no, not enough energy released by performing another redox reaction with those electrons to actually power any more active transport. Essentially, those electrons contain no more energy. Okay, So they, have, they can't just sit in your body. They have to be eliminated. So we have to give them to a final or a terminal electron acceptor. We have to give them to something to get them out of your body, to get them out of the cell before they can harm things. Because electrons are actually kind of toxic. We don't really want them around. It produces things called free radicals. Um, that's why antioxidants are such a big deal because free radicals can actually damage your cells. So we have to give them to something. But complex four, as it turns out, in many living things, can only give that, those electrons to one particular molecule. And it turns out for all of, all of life, including us, that considers themselves to be aerobic, the thing that complex four can give its electrons to is oxygen. That's it. That's why we breathe oxygen, because oxygen is our terminal electron acceptor. The only place that complex four in your body and the body of and the cells of aerobic organisms can give its electrons to to get rid of it as a waste product is to oxygen. So what happens? Complex four gives those electrons to oxygen, that converts it into water, which is the other waste product of cellular respiration. We release CO2 and we release water. That's it. That's why you breathe oxygen. That's the big secret. If you don't breathe oxygen, you can't get rid of your electrons and the whole process backs up and you can't produce ATP anymore. That's why you breathe oxygen. As crazy as that seems, it's your terminal electron acceptor. But we're not done because we still haven't actually produced any ATP. And this is where we go back to our conversation about potential energy. The energy contained by ex the energy released by exchanging those electrons through stepwise redox reactions was used to produce a proton gradient on one side of that biological membrane, whether it's the inner mitochondrial membrane or the cell membrane are a lot of different pro are a lot of protons, lots and lots of protons on the other side of it are way fewer protons. In other words, we now have an electrochemical gradient. It's electrochemical because protons are charged. They have a positive charge. On one side, what we call an inward rectifying electrochemical gradient. Those protons want to get back into the cell. But remember, they can't cross the biological membrane. They can't because they're charged. And only hydro, small hydrophobic things can make it across. A charged thing is hydrophilic. So how do they get back in and how can we use that to make that energy? That's where chemiosmosis comes in. There's one protein 
inside of that biological membrane that will allow those protons to come back in. It's a transporter called ATP synthase. And ATP synthase is one of the most remarkable enzymes you will ever see. ATP synthase is an example of what we would call a molecular motor or a molecular machine. It's amazing. It physically rotates as it allows protons to come back in via their gradient. And if you remember correctly, electrochemical gradients are a form of potential energy. In fact, in biological systems, that is the uh, biological equivalent of Niagara Falls. Those protons want so desperately to come back in, and it is so exergonic to allow those protons to come in in the direction of their gradient that they can actually physically crank ATP synthase. They can make it physically turn like a piston through a rotational mechanism, and the energy released by those protons coming in is sufficient to power the endergonic reaction of phosphorylating ADP and an inorganic phosphate, combining those to produce a molecule of ATP. Now, I can't stress enough how amazingly efficient this is. The overwhelming majority of ATP produced through cellular respiration is produced this way. So for example, under normal cellular conditions, somewhere between 32 and 34 ATP are produced through this process per molecule of gluco glucose that goes in. Now I want you to think about that in context. Through substrate level phosphorylation in both glycolysis and the citric acid cycle, we produce 4 ATP. We are going to produce 10 times the amount of ATP almost through oxidative phosphorylation, through this particular type of phosphorylation. And the thing I need you to understand is this. This particular process is the key to multicellular life. In order for large, complex, multicellular organisms to exist, they have to be this efficient with their energy. It's one of the reasons why you do not find large, multicellular, anaerobic life on planet Earth. It simply can't be done. The anaerobic production of ATP through fermentation, which we'll talk about in just a second, is so inefficient that it could never allow large, complex, multicellular organisms to exist. This particular process was essential for the evolution of multicellular life, and it's so essential that all large multicellular organisms, in fact, almost all multicellular organisms on the planet Earth, are powered using cellular respiration. Now, the one thing I will stress is this. Almost all large multicellular organisms are aerobic respirers, in some unicellular organisms, there is what we call anaerobic respiration, where instead of giving their, uh, their electrons to oxygen, they could give them to sulfur-containing compounds or nitrogen-containing compounds, things like that, uh, to produce weird byproducts like hydrogen sulfide gas. Um, but again, you don't find that in multi large multicellular eukaryotes. You tend to find them in single-celled organisms. One of the reasons why is it's not, not as efficient as aerobic respiration. Aerobic respiration seems to be the most efficient way that life has evolved on this planet Earth to produce ATP, and it's the reason you exist. But what about those organisms that are anaerobic? What about those organisms that can't do cellular respiration because they don't have the enzymes, they're not complex enough to produce those enzymes, or they are anaerobic. They are organisms that do not use oxygen at all. Well, the other pathway to produce energy through anaerobic metabolism is known as fermentation. So fermentation is essentially a way of regenerating your electron carriers following glycolysis. So if we look at fermentation, it looks basically like this. You go back and you take your glucose molecule and you do glycolysis. And the end result of glycolysis, as you will recall, is 2 ATP net two molecules of NADH, and two molecules of pyruvate. Now, the ATP is great, because that's energy. That's what they need to survive. It's inefficient compared to what cellular respiration can do, but it's there. You also have these two molecules of pyruvate hanging around, but the big problem is this. In order to be able to do the energy production phase of glycolysis, to actually release those two ATP, you have to reduce your NAD plus into NADH. What happens when all of your NAD plus is gone and there's no electron acceptor for the energy production phase to occur? That's the problem. That can't happen. So fermentation is a sort of add-on step at the end whereby we take those electrons from NADH, 
they are placed enzymatically onto pyruvate or another organic molecule to regenerate the NAD+. And then that molecule is typically excreted as a waste product. In general, fermentation can produce one of two things. Fermentation either produces an acid, which gets secreted, so something like lactic acid is a great example of an acid that gets produced in fermentation, or it can produce alcohol, very commonly ethanol, and carbon dioxide as a byproduct. The net result of fermentation is to produce either an acid or an alcohol waste product and to regenerate NAD plus that can go back in and then be further reduced through subsequent energy production phases of glycolysis to produce those two ATP. Now, what are the advantages to fermentation? Well, the major advantage to fermentation is that you can be anaerobic. It can occur without the presence of oxygen. And one of the things people often underestimate is how much of the planet Earth doesn't have oxygen on it. Um, a significant portion of life is anaerobic, and this is the way that they produce their energy, through fermentation. What's the downside? Well, the major downside is this. It's very inefficient. For each molecule of glucose, you get 2 ATP out of it. We get somewhere between 36 and 38 ATP out of it. They get 2, which is why any organism that, that produces energy exclusively through ferment fermentation is almost always unicellular. There are no large multicellular fermenters. In fact, I think there's only one or two species of multicellular life at all that falls into the realm of multicellular and they're tiny microscopic multicellular organisms. So there are pros and cons. But the other thing I want to stress to you is fermentation is not a metabolic pathway that is reserved strictly for anaerobic unicellular organisms. Did you know that you can ferment and you do it on a fairly regular basis? It's not our preferred mechanism, but there are times in your life when you are anaerobic and you may not recognize this. Did you, have you ever done intense athletic activity, gone for a run, played a sport like soccer, gone to the gym, and then the next day your limbs feel heavy and, and, you're, and you were breathing heavy while you were doing that exercise, and the next day your limbs feel heavy and they feel sore and all that sort of stuff. What happened to you? Why are you breathing so hard? Well, the reason you're breathing hard is you are consuming a lot of energy when you do this high intensity work. And in order to keep up, your body's trying to produce more energy. And it's trying to produce more energy through cellular respiration. But the problem is your body under normal breathing conditions doesn't have enough oxygen to keep up with the energy demand. So what does it do? Well, you breathe in more oxygen and that will keep the oxygen circulating in your blood. But there's no way to get enough oxygen to your deep tissues, in, particularly, in particular your muscles, to actually provide enough oxygen to do efficient cellular respiration to meet those energy demands. So what are those muscle cells left to do? Well, they're left to perform a type of metabolism that doesn't require oxygen. They're left to ferment. So what happens? It takes all of those glucose reserves or it takes whatever it can as an energy source, puts them through glycolysis, turns them into pyruvate, and then rapidly just regenerates its NAD plus pool by essentially fermenting that pyruvate and producing a byproduct called lactic acid. You're an acid fermenter. Now for the next day or two, that lactic acid can actually stay in those muscle tissues, which is why they feel heavy and they may hurt. They may feel, they actually may feel firm because of all of that waste product. Now your body's kind of cool like this. What's it going to do after a day or two? It's actually going to absorb all of those, all of that pyruvate or all of that lactic acid that your body produces, it's gonna send it to your liver where your liver is actually gonna regenerate through a process called gluconeogenesis. It's gonna regenerate, um, it's gonna regenerate that glucose and give your body another try to be more efficient in its metabolism and its catabolism of this glucose. So your liver actually puts it back together and is like, here, try again and be more efficient with it this time. Your body's designed to waste nothing um, rather than secreting it, excreting it as a waste product like a microbe might do because your body has an alternative pathway, the aerobic cellular respiration pathway where you can get more energy out of it. Like I said, your body is very good at being energy efficient, which is really kind of cool. So the last thing that we'll talk about is what if the thing you eat or the thing you're using as food isn't glucose? As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, everything eventually makes it into the cellular respiration pathway, but only carbohydrates, for example, uh, go through the entire process. So what if the thing you eat is a carbohydrate, but it's not glucose? Well, for the most part, everything that comes in that's going to be a digestible sugar is going to be something that is an isomer of glucose. Fructose, 
galactose. You can think disaccharides like lactose and maltose. Those are just simply two glucoses uh, attached to each other or a glucose and a galactose uh, taken to, uh, uh, attached to each other. So the bonds are, are hydrolyzed and then galactose is isomerized into glucose. Fructose is isos isomerized into glucose to go through the, gluco uh, through the glycolysis process. Remember, if it's a, uh, a large digestible polysaccharide, if it's starch or if it's uh, glycogen, those are just long chains of glucose. So you, you hydrolyze those bonds, you release the glucoses and put them through the glycolysis process. What if it's a fat? So fats are actually kind of neat. So the, you have these long chain fatty acid tails, uh, typically in the form of a triglyceride, you're gonna have uh, these long fatty acid tails and then you're gonna have them uh, attached to a glycerol head group. Well, fats get broken down this way. Fats undergo a process called beta oxidation. Um, this happens mainly in the mitochondria. And what happens is, is these fatty acid tails are cleaved into two carbon chunks, and then they're given a coenzyme A molecule, and they enter into the process as acetyl-CoA. So they become that two carbon molecule that initiates the citric acid cycle, and they go through that way. What about the glycerol head groups? Are we gonna waste those? Absolutely not. That's a three carbon molecule. Where does that go in? Hey, that actually goes in as glyceraldehyde three phosphate. So that actually enters into the beginning of the energy production phase of glycolysis. What if you're a protein? Well, proteins are consistent, consist of amino acid monomers. The first thing that happens with proteins uh, is they're gonna go undergo a process called deamination. So they're gonna have their amino group uh, removed from their amino acids, and that's gonna basically leave that carbon skeleton laying around. Uh, the amino groups are removed from the body. They're what we call nitrogenous waste. Uh, so they're often excreted in urine. Um, what happens with the carbon skeletons? Well, most of those carbon skeletons at this point look very similar to either um, the intermediates of the citric acid cycle or they get converted into acetyl-CoA or they get converted into pyruvate and begin the process as either pyruvate, acetyl-CoA or one of the intermediates of the citric acid cycle in our process this way. Bottom line is your body can take a lot of different things. In fact, almost every macromolecule that your body absorbs can be converted into something useful as long as there's the enzymes to catabolize it into a useful form. Our body tends not to use nucleic acids as an energy source. Most cells don't. Um, that's not one of their roles. Their role isn't really involved in nutrition. But when it comes to lipids, carbohydrates, and proteins, those are going to be broken down and placed into the respiration pathway at the appropriate point in time. Remember that bodies, our cells are a marvel of efficiency and will use uh, whatever they can in order to survive um, as long as they have the enzymes to break them down. The other thing to realize is this, and we're not really going to get into it in today's video, but almost all of these products can also be used as a basis for biosynthesis. Some of these citric acid cycle intermediates, for example, or pyruvate, can actually be broken away and undergo different processes to assemble the biological macromolecules that we need. For example, you can actually take fatty acids and convert them into acetyl-CoA. From acetyl-CoA, they can actually be back converted into pyruvate and through a process called gluconeogenesis, be turned into sugar. We can also take sugars and break them down into acetyl-CoA and reassemble them as fats, a process known as lipogenesis. Remember, I talked about in our, in our video about biological macromolecules. Your body likes to store energy in the form of triglycerides. Well, the first step in that process is break sugars down, convert them into acetyl-CoA, reassemble them through lipogenesis to build fatty acid tails, and then assemble them with a glycerol head group to produce triglycerides. So in a sense, all that sugar, you, if you overeat too much sugar, it will turn into fat because that's how your body's going to store it. It doesn't like to waste it. Proteins, for example, can be broken down. Their amino acids can either be deaminated and then uh, digested uh, or catabolized to produce uh, to release electrons and produce energy, or they can just be reassembled and utilized by an, uh, one of your ribosomes to produce a protein that you need. So all of these catabolic processes also produce the precursors for most of your anabolic metabolism. When we talk about hormonal regulation in a different video, that's one of the things that your, your body as a whole uh, sets the table for. It decides, are we in a catabolic state where we're harvesting our food to produce ATP, or are we in an anabolic state where we're looking to store stuff or biosynthesize molecules for later use? Metabolism is a very complex subject, uh, so we don't have time to get into all the details of it. But I hope you learned a lot today about how cellular respiration works and how that makes multicellular life possible. Okay, so thank you for hanging in there for our very lengthy conversation about cellular respiration. Cellular respiration, just like all metabolic pathways, is a very complex topic that can be challenging to understand. I hope we did a good job of breaking it down for you guys and, and help, helping you see how these 
different enzymatic pathways work together to allow you to produce the ATP you need to survive and how important cellular respiration is in particular for organisms like us that are large and multicellular and require a good deal of metabolic efficiency. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you guys learned a lot and I look forward to seeing you guys next time. Bye.